And the children, ages, do we have public church today? Do we? Okay. Children ages three to six can be dismissed to toddler church if the parents so choose. Okay, we have that going on in the back. The rest of us can turn to Revelation chapter two. Revelation chapter two. And uh, we will be looking at the revelation of Jesus Christ as we have been um, since the beginning of the year. And um, again, for um, those who weren't here then, a year and a half ago, um, I just felt really burdened of the Lord um, that beginning in January 2009, it was the time for us to, to begin looking at the book of Revelation, which is really kind of interesting because for years I had always stated that I would only preach the book of Revelation when I understood it. And so people laughed and said, then you'll never preach it. And I said, that's true. So anyways, but the Lord, I mean, it was just, it, I, I knew there was nothing I could do to get away from it. The Lord was telling me January 2009 was the time to do it. And so again, I can't tell you that I, uh, I've got it all under my belt, but all I can tell you is that it's a great journey, and I hope that you enjoy the journey, the odyssey, as much as I'm enjoying it, and again, we were going to go through the, uh, the letters to the churches in uh, two, three, four at the most weeks, but the Lord really convicted me a couple weeks ago that uh, the message to the churches is important, and it needs to be done individually, and so um, some of the times... The message is going to seem redundant, but as I meditated on that this week, I thought, you know what, maybe the redundancy is important. You know, there was um, a, a preacher, it was at the Moody Bible Conference years ago, and I'm trying to think, it was Tony Evans, I, in my mind, it, it's, I think Tony Evans, but it probably wasn't him, it was probably someone else uh, who was a big name like that, but anyways, he was going through the point of, to, to these preachers about how they could just go turn around and and preach the same message two or three weeks in a row because, you know, so many people weren't there, and of the people who were there, so many of them were, you know, they keep going off to the bathroom here or there, and so they didn't hear the whole thing anyway. The other segment of them were falling asleep, and, you know, and the other ones have this attention disorder, and so you really only 10% of them really remember your message anyway, so go ahead and preach it again. So, anyways, I always kind of chuckle about that, but the fact is, the other side is that, you know, the Word of God is important in redundancy is important. And there's a reason why I encourage people to, to seek to read the book of Proverbs every day. To, you know, there's 31 chapters. You can read one chapter a day. And I know in February there's only 28 days, maybe 29 on the leap year. But that's okay. You can read two or three chapters in one day. It's, it's okay to do that. And, uh, but on a, on a typical month, 30, 30, one, 30, 31 days in a month, that you can read one chapter of Proverbs. And you know, it's very important to read that. And Devin had a... Uh, a, a state saying that you told me, I don't know how many years ago now, do you remember what the saying is? A proverb day? A proverb day keeps the devil away. And we're not just talking about a, a one verse of Proverbs, we're talking about a chapter of Proverbs, okay? And so, but many of us like to do one verse of Proverbs. We think one verse of Scripture is going to help us out, but it's not. You've got to inundate yourself with the Word of God. Now, understand that that one chapter of Proverbs is to go along with the rest of your daily bread, you know, with the rest of your food that you're eating. And so, so I encourage you, the redundancy of the Word of God is extremely important. Many of us are thick. We're like the Old Testament Israelites, and we're stiff-necked and stubborn-hearted, and it takes quite a while for the, uh, for the tilling of the heart and to, to happen and for the fertilizing. So as we go through these um, letters to the churches, um, we'll see some redundancy. Now, as we go through the book of Revelation, we saw that there is a, uh, an outline that is given in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, by Jesus Christ himself, where he tells John that he wants to him to write down about the things that have been, the things that are, and the things that will be. And in each one of those categories, there was a message that went along with it. First of all, there was the message to John, which was about who Jesus Christ was and what he was going to see. The message, the things that are, or the message to the churches. And then when we get into chapter 4, probably around the, the month of March, um, it will be the things that will be. Now, and again, remember that before we get into the, the, the message of the future, and in chapter 4 and beyond, we're actually going to do a little bit of a hiatus on biblical prophecy. We're going to go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to come forward and see what the, the Word of God talks about in prophecy, so that when we get to the book of Revelation, uh, back to the prof prophetical portion, that it is in context with what the Bible teaches, rather than just drawing something out and making it say what we want it to say, but to keep it in, in, in consistent with the rest of Scripture. So, as we go through the message of the churches, we can see that there is a message to the church of Ephesus, to the church of Smyrna, to the church of Pergamos, to the church of Thyatira, and 
You'll note, as I did, I noted this morning, actually someone brought it to my attention this morning, I've never seen this before, I've always been saying the, the, the name of the church we're going to be talking about this morning, Theratyra. Wrong, it's not Theratyra, it's, what, what's wrong about that? It's Thyatira, there's no R after the Y. Anyways, so in everything, all the publications that you've been getting over the last couple weeks, there has been an R after the Y, and there will be throughout today. So before somebody points it out, I want to point out to you that yes, I know that there is the boo-boo on all that. It's the church of Thyatira. Thyatira. I got For years I've been calling us Thyatira, so I got to change. It's Thyatira. So anyways, if, if I have to stop and slow down on that one today, it's, it's for that reason. I've always been saying it wrong. In fact, when I read it, I read it with an R in it. I don't know where the R comes from. Anyways, so, but that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the church of Thyatira, not Thyatira. Anyways, so as we go through it, we're going to use the same outline as we've been using for every single one of the churches. And that is, we're going to look at the introduction of Christ, Christ's introduction, Christ's commendation, Christ's challenge, and Christ's promise. Now, to the church of Thyatira, here beginning in verse 18, how does Jesus Christ introduce himself to this church? Now, note that each, each church, he's introduced himself a little bit differently. But to this church, it's kind of interesting. First, he says, to, this is going to come from the Son of God. Now, what's really interesting, hey Ben, can you flip those that way? Okay. Uh, the Son of God, each one of these is going to come back from Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. And in verse 13 of chapter 1, he refers to himself as the Son of Man. That John says, I saw one like the Son of Man. Now, this refers to the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One who was to come, has both the name, the Son of God, and the name, the Son of Man. But both the Son of God and the Son of Man kind of join together. Does anybody have an indicator of, of what those two names, in conjunction, really indicate, they show us? The dual nature of Jesus. The dual nature of Christ. This is exciting stuff, because He was the Son of Man. Why? He was a seed of a woman. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we're told that, that your seed and the seed of the, of the, seed of the serpent would, would fight against each other, right? And so he was, in a sense, a, the son of a man. But the other side is he is the son of God. And why is that? He had, no father. he had no earthly father. That God himself was the father. And so we know that in Christ, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt what? Bodily. The bodily side refers to man. The fullness of the Godhead dwelling within him is God. And so, it's a mind-boggling thing to me, but it's almost like you got this, this glass and you pour the drink into it. The drink is not the glass, the glass is not the drink, but yet, when you say, can I have the glass of Coke, you're really not talking about one or the other, are you? You're talking about what? The whole package. And so, Jesus Christ is the package. He is God, and He is man. He's Jesus, but He's God and He's man, all combined together. And so, Jesus, here, as He's going to declare to the church of Thyatira, that he is the son of God. He is, in fact, God in the flesh. He is deity. He is, as well, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire. And again, we talked about this a little bit in chapter 1, when we went through what John saw, these eyes that are burning eyes. These eyes which not only reveals the brilliance of his eyes, but I think as well is the, the eyes that can see in you. As we talked about last week about Jesus Christ having the, the double-edged sword, and he's the, the, the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the, the heart. And uh, I believe that as Jesus was able to uh, look amongst the people and to read their thoughts and to tell them what they were thinking, <laughs> that these eyes that were like flames of fire reveal both purity and uh, as well as the, the insight that he has. He is also the one who has feet like fine brass, like the burning brass, the, the, the brilliance. And so the picture that that John saw was this, this picture of brilliance that was there. And Jesus says, I am the guy, if you would, that John saw. Okay, which is really an exciting thing as well. Now, Christ's commendation to the church of Thyatira, here, is interesting. He, first of all, he says, I know your past faithfulness. I know your past faithfulness, your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. You have done a great job in the past. Since the time that you were saved, I know that you sought to save, that you sought to serve me. That's a wonderful thing. However, not only do I know your past faithfulness, I know your progress. I know the progress that you've had. I know that now the works that you do now, your last works here, 
they far exceed, they far, they're in far, they far excel than those you did at first. And so the word there that are being, um, are more, is actually the word which means to be more excellent than, to excel, to be better than. And so the idea is that, listen, that as you have, and keep this in contrast with what he's getting ready to tell them, okay? That as you have grown in me, that you have grown in a way that you're, you're seeking to do more and more on my behalf. Okay? That's an awesome testimony, isn't it? Okay? And Christ himself gives it. But as he did with the church of Ephesus, as he did with the church of Pergamos, he goes on and says what? Nevertheless, or however, don't you hate the neverthelesses and the howevers? I have what? I have something against you. And this is to the challenge, the Christ challenge to the church. And he says to them right off the bat, this is the thing that I have against you. You're allowing Jezebel to teach and seduce my servants. You're allowing that woman Jezebel, who claims to be a prophetess, and she's not, but claims to be a prophetess, you're allowing her to be in your church teaching and seducing my children. Now, a couple questions we have to ask ourselves about this as it applies to us then, as it applies to, to the church of Thyatira, as, as we go to Thyatira. First of all, who is Jezebel? Is she an actual person? Or is, again, this is like talking to the, the church of Pergamos, we're talking about the, the Balaam, that Balaam is, is, is an Old Testament character. And what is he talking about, about teaching and seducing the servants? First of all, we want to go back to the Jezebel, Jezebelian effect that there was on ancient Israel. Okay, because Jezebel does go back, all the way back, into the Old Testament. So, if you would, I want you to go, in your Bibles, turn back to 1 Kings, chapter 16. 1 Kings 16. And we want to look at the Jezebelian effect in ancient Israel. Jezebel, while you're turning there, was the daughter of the king of Sidonian, of Sidon, the Sidonians. His name was Ethbaal. Ethbaal is a, um, was a term which means a servant of Baal. Baal was the, the masculine fertility god um, back in ancient Near East Asia. His counterpart was, anybody know? Asherah. Good, Asherah, who was the female fertility goddess, okay, and, uh, in whom the, the, the Sidonians worshipped highly. And so as we see here in 1 Kings chapter 16, look at verse 30. It says, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of Yahweh, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Now, Ahab, the son of Omri, was the king of Israel. Now, understand that you've got to go back a little bit in a the, the, little bit of the history there as well, that the northern tribes is what we refer to as the nation of Israel. The northern tribes broke off of Israel, if you would, at, during the reign of Rehoboam. And so Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, and so when Rehoboam became the king, he, the people came to him and he said, listen, you know, you've got to soften the, the workload that, that Solomon, your father, has placed upon him. And Rehoboam said, let me think about this, come back in three days, and, and I'll give you an answer. So he talked to, to, the, to the wise counsel of his father, and those counselors said, listen to the people, give them what they want, they'll forever serve you. He didn't like that, because that meant that what? He's going to give up things, he's going to give up power, he's going to give up some of his affluence and some of the things that he's going to get. So he turned around and talked to his croonies, to his peers, and his peers said, no, don't do that. Don't give in to him. You'll be a wimp. Here's what you need to do. You need to tell him that, you know, you're going to be harsher. You think Solomon was rough? I'm going to be even harsher. So Rehoboam goes back to the people in three days, and he says, listen, you know, you thought my dad was tough. I'm going to be even tougher. And so the people say, go to your, go to your tent, so Israel. What do we have to do with the, with the, the, the sons of David? And so they take Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who we read about right here, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and they make him king. Now Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he thinks to himself, listen, what's going to happen every year is the people are going to go back to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. And as they go back to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh, 
they're going to start to realize, man, we're divided in our kingdom and we need to be one again so we can glorify God. I know what I'll do. I'll set up golden calves. I'll set up one in Samaria and one in Dan. I think that's where they were. And uh, I'm going I'm to set up these two, these two golden calves and people can come there and they can worship the God who led you out of Egypt. Now, if I said to you, here, O Israel, is the God who led you out of Egypt, who would you recognize this was? Yeah. Yahweh. And so what he's saying is that this golden calf represented Yahweh. It was syncretism. It was a, it was a syncretistic practice. They were amal- he was amalgamating the, 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 the gods of the world because the, the golden calf was a symbol for Baal. Baal was always symbolized as a golden calf. If you remember, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, and they took all their golden, their golden earrings, and they threw them in the fire, and poof, out came this golden calf. At least that's what Aaron tried to tell Moses, huh? I mean, I mean, is that what your kids try to do to you sometimes? You know, I remember when, I don't remember literally doing this. I don't honestly remember literally doing it, but my mom has told me this story over and over again, so I know that I must have done this. Anyways, I put out a fire in my closet. I don't know how the fire got there in my closet, but I put it out. They smelled the smoke, and they said, Bob, were you, were, were, Bobby probably, were you playing with matches again? No, Mom. I, there was this, I came in and there was this fire in the, in the, in, in the closet and I stamped it out. No, I, I honestly don't remember it. However, since I was the only person there and I was a pyromaniac as a kid, it probably was me. Anyways, um, but don't you love the kind of stories that kids like to play, right? Kids like to tell, I don't know where the fire came from. I just could think that I was here and I put it out. Gee, Moses, I don't know where the golden calf came from. We just put the, the, the gold into the fire and poof, out it came. Don't we try to do that with God sometimes? Don't we try to do it with other people? We kind of put this farce on. You know, James chapter 1 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. For deceiving your what? Your own self. Your own self. <laughs> Nobody else is deceiving you. And you're not deceiving. Everybody else can see that you're playing the game. But you deceive yourself. And so they're there they're playing the game. So Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he makes this golden calf. And he places it out there, and he tells Israel, this is the God that delivered you out of, out of Egypt. And so he has everybody starting to worship there. Well, throughout the kings of Israel, it always goes back to the sin of, the Jer- of, to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Only one king is, is stated in any way that he did more evil than even Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And that was Ahab. Ahab. Okay, and Ahab, what did he do that even excelled Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? He married, he married Jezebel. <laughs> he went to the, to the king of the Sidonians, Ethbaal, and he formed an allegiance with him by marrying his daughter, Jezebel. Again, the word Ethbaal means a servant of Baal. He, was, he had this name that was an official name that referred to him as being this one who was tied to Baal. And his daughter Jezebel was a priestess in the, the cult of Asherah. And we know the effect that Jezebel had because the minute Ahab marries her, he builds a temple to Baal and he sets up altars to Baal. And we're told that he also sets up what? The Asherah poles. He begins the worship of the fertility gods. This all comes from the influence of Jezebel. Now, go on, and I don't have this one up there, but turn to chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. It's on your sermon note sheets. We're, we're confirmed in what we're told about Jezebel's influence, the effect of Jezebel upon Ahab in northern Israel. It says, verse 25, chapter 21, But there was none, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of Yahweh. Why? Because Jezebel's wife stirred him up. Ladies, you have a phenomenal influence on your husbands. I want to serve the Lord and I want to do what's right and I'd rather please God than men. But i got to live with my wife. You get it? And, and ladies, you can encourage your husband to righteousness, or you can encourage your husband to ungodliness. My prayer is that you encourage your husband. That doesn't mean he's going to follow. That doesn't mean he's going he's to heed it. But you have a traumatic influence in his life. And so I encourage you to use that influence toward God. 
clearly Jezebel was not a godly individual. She was rather a very pagan individual, and she used the influence that she had on her husband for a very pagan, very pagan manners. And so she caused her husband to be known historically as the king who was more evil than any other king. Now, that's bad enough, but I want you to turn in, in, to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 17, and I want you to consider the effect upon Jehoshaphat. Because if we talk about Jehoshaphat, most of us, when we, when we think about Jehoshaphat, think of Jehoshaphat as being what? A godly king. I'm sorry. Okay? He's a godly king. Okay? Um, and so, here we have Jehoshaphat and Judah. Now, Judah was the southern kingdom. These were the, 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 the ones who came in the line of David. And so, in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, beginning at verse 3, here's what we read. Now, Yahweh, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the former ways of his father David. Now, look at what it says now. Remember, because we just read about Ahab, and Jehoshaphat and Ahab lived at the same time. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. So when he's saying he's not walking in the acts of Israel, who is he talking about? Ahab and Jezebel. So he's saying, listen, this guy was a godly guy. This guy sought the Lord. This is the guy who, who served God and, and desired everything that God wa wanted. But as talking to the church of Thyatira, now we're talking about Jeroboam, there is a however that we have to give. Turn to chapter 18. Verse 1. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. Do you know why? Because God gave it to him. Because he served God. And by marriage... He allied himself to Ahab. And in marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him. And the people who were with him and persuaded him to go up to Ramoth Gilead and ward with them together. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me in war against Ramoth Gilead? Get Jehoshaphat's answer. And he answered him, Jehoshaphat answered Ahab, I am as you are, and my people as your people. We will be with you in war. Jehoshaphat, now turn, keep going down to chapter 19, okay? Jehoshaphat, being a godly man, allies himself in marriage. Now, we don't know at this moment, just from reading that verse, but that either means that Jehoshaphat married another woman who happened to be of the house of Ahab or he married off one of his sons, which is what he did do. We'll see in a moment. Chapter 19, verse 1 says, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house. This is after the war and um, Ahab gets struck in this war. Safely to his house in Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Henani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate Yahweh? Therefore, the wrath of Yahweh is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. Now, what, a, what an incredible statement. God comes and he chastises Jehoshaphat. Okay? Jehoshaphat is seeking the Lord. He's seeking to make his land pure. What did he do? Yeah, he got rid of all the, the objects of false worship in his land. He got rid of the Asherah poles. Even though the, the, the queen of Israel is, is doing everything she can to promote the worship of Asherah and the worship of Baal, the king of Judah is destroying it all. You know, he's saying, no, no, no. But yet, though he lived this way, right, he said these things and he did these things, he turned around and assisted the ungodly in promoting their nation. And not only that, he married off his son to the daughter of Jezebel. Let's go on to chapter 21, verse 1. Now Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. That means that Jehoshaphat what? He died. What happens after a king dies? Somebody else becomes king. And during these days, the son would become king. So, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. Now he had many sons. So, but let's look on. 
verse, um, go on down to verse 4. It says, Now when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword. Nice guy, huh? And all of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And Now get this. Remember what we read about Jehoshaphat and how he walked in the ways of Yahweh, right? This is Jehoshaphat's son. Verse 6, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for he had the daughter of Ahab, and mind you, Jezebel, as a wife. And he did evil in the sight of Yahweh. Jezebel's influence goes on in her children. Moms and dads. I read this passage, and this, this thing just kicks me down and puts me on my lung and derriere. It doesn't matter how much you say you love God. What are you doing to pass down your faith? Jehoshaphat married his son to the daughter of the devil. Think about it. There wasn't a more wicked woman on the earth. There wasn't a more wicked king on the earth. And Jehoshaphat, a servant of God, had his son marry their daughter. What has light to do with darkness? What has Christ to do with Belial? You cannot be unequally well, you can be, but you should not be unequally yoked. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. You cannot allow your children to become romantically involved or interested with unbelievers. But they will be. They will be if that's who you set them up with. Now, I'm not saying shun the world. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying there's a wisdom that's there. And we've got to be careful of the influences that we're allowing in our children. Let's go on with this because this is very profound. Chapter uh, 21, drop down to verse 20. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years, and to no one's sorrow. Isn't this amazing? It's in the Bible. To no one's sorrow, he died. He departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place. For the raiders who came with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. Guess whose son, or grandson, becomes the new king? Athaliah's son, Jezebel's granddaughter. He also, verse 3, walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him, to do wickedly. To do wickedly. Does that sound familiar? She's a chip that falls right from the, from the block, doesn't she? As mother, so daughter. Why do we think this is... Well, this person will change. This person will change. It doesn't change. Rather, the evil has changed that which was good. Verse 4, Therefore he did evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors. Phenomenal. Think about it. He also, verse 5, he followed their advice and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Haziel, king of Syria, in Ramoth Gilead. Drop down to verse 10. Because now Ahaziah dies. It says, verse 10, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and did what? She destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. you know why she did that? So she herself could reign. And Athaliah was the only queen ever to reign over Judah. And she reigned for six years. 
the daughter of Jezebel, reigned over the house of Judah. That is what Jehoshaphat, the godly man, allowed as his legacy. Men, what legacy are you leaving on this earth? You may serve the Lord, and you may try to do all these wonderful things and try to love God with all your heart, but what are you passing down? Judah, from this point forward, is going to struggle like they've never struggled before with fighting Baal worship and Asherah worship and all the other worships, the Moloch and Chemosh and all the rest of these. Why? Because of the influence that a godly man allowed to come in. This leads us then into the, the church of Thyatira. Jezebel's influence on the church of the Thyatira. This woman Jezebel was a woman who seduced an entire nation into following after other gods. Clearly, there was either a woman or a group of people who could be described by the term Jezebelian. That is actually a term. I looked it up. I have people come up and say, ah, you're making up words. This isn't actually a word. Just the Jezebelian effect, the Jezebelian influence. And it comes from, guess who? Jezebel. And it refers to someone who has a seductive influence, a wicked influence through seduction and deception on other people. And so these people came into the church of Thyatira and they encouraged the people to be a part of pagan worship. Just as in Pergamos we read about those who followed the, 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 the doctrines of Balaam. Now we have the doctrines of Jezebel, the teachings of Jezebel, the influence of Jezebel coming into the church. And again, this is where I said that some of the message is redundant. Again, think of the church of the United States. We're going to get there in a moment. The influence that Jezebel has, even upon us as well. But in the church of Thyatira, they were told that she was seducing the church to commit sexual immorality. I don't think that that's just... Um, allegorical. I think that they were actually participating in the fertility cults. I think that there is though, as well, the other side of that, when she was seducing the church to eat things sacrificed to idols, that God says that Israel was his bride. Christ, for the, the church, is the bride of Christ. And so, in a sense, when we go after other gods, we are committing what? Adultery, Adultery which is sexual Immorality. Remember when, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, that I shared from Ephesians chapter 5, how Paul says, Now for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall be clinging to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Now this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. That that, that marital act is, is, a, is the most intimate picture that you can make between Christ and the church. In our sexual morality, our, our sexual pureness, is not just to our wife and not just to herself, but rather it is as a testimony before the world of the, the fidelity that there is between Christ and the church. Could you imagine Jesus Christ, quote unquote, a whoring after other brides, after other women? But we as the bride many times go a whoring after other men. And so, the same thing is, she's seducing the church to commit sexual immorality. I think physically, I think actuality, literally, but I think that there is also the allegorical uh, figurative sense that is pictured there as well. She was seducing the church to eat things, sacrifice to idols. Now, Paul says a whole lot about this, and in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, we read, beginning at verse 14, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, flee from idolatry. And he's talking in verse in respect to the children of Israel, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Because he said beforehand that they're not. I mean, we know that there's no such thing as a God. I mean, there's only one God. All the other are what? They're fakes. They're false. However, look what he says. What, I am, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or that anything offered to an idol is anything? 
Verse 20. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. So what are false gods? They're demons. They sacrifice them to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. In Christ, how many sins have been forgiven? All. In God's grace, what can you do? Anything you want. However, we're told right at the very end of this passage, and I didn't have space for it to put up here, not all, not all things are what? Beneficial. Not all things edify. And so look at this. He says, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink, verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord, I think it's Yahweh, to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? When we sit out there and we pretend that, that we're believers, and you very may very well be, but then we turn around and go whoring after the things of this world, that we want to participate in their things, that we want to work for, uh, we want to worship. I mean, we, we, we don't say that, but when, when you start adoring the things that the world has, and you start following after it, and you put all your money toward it, that's where your heart is. Jesus was very clear that where your heart is, there where your what? That's where you're going to spend your, your money. Where your money is, there's where your heart is also. You will give your money. You will offer sacrifices of your resources to those things that you honor the most. So if we look at your checkbook, who do you spend the most on? Where do you spend the most? If we opened up your day runner, your palm pilot, and we looked at your time, and we could have listed there where you, what things you read and what things you listen to and what things you watch. Where do you give yourself over to? We don't have, we have a couple different temples here, but we don't have any, a couple different temples here that really do temple prostitution. So I, I don't think any of you are actually going down to any one of these uh, idol worship places and, and becoming part of the Jezebelian effect for Thyatira. But as we consider that figurative, allegorical sense about offering ourselves to idols and we're offering ourselves for sexual immorality, Adultery, spiritual adultery. I ask you, as I challenge myself, how much am I being drawn away from the fidelity to my Lord by the things of this earth? There is the lust of the eyes, there is the lust of the flesh, there is the pride of life. But we're told that he who is a friend of the world is an enmity with God. And that if you love those other things more than you love God, he says, be careful because these things are what? Passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. That's 1 John chapter 2 and James 4 put together. Are you participating in the table of demons? In the table of the Lord at the same time? But let's go on. We have as well the... Uh, the Jezebel and effect upon the modern church. This word for here that we're talking in Revelation, go back to Revelation, if you would. In Revelation chapter 2, when it says that she has seduced the church, the word here is, me, is the Greek word, uh, which means to lead astray deceptively. And so it says here that um, my servants, it says that the prophet is to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality. Now, she is leading them astray deceptively. Okay? In this presence of seduction, we see that the Word of God has warned us about it. Okay? Jesus Christ himself warned us that, that in the end times, that this influence was going to come back again. In Matthew 24, when Jesus was asked about the end times, he says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and at the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to, him, said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. This is our word for seduced. Okay? Take heed that no one seduces you. 
For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will seduce many. They'll deceive, lead astray many people. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then he talks about the, the earthquakes and the famines and, and the other things that are going to be signs of the end time. Verse 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and seduce, deceive, lead astray many. And because lawlessness will abound, why do you think lawlessness will abound? Because many false prophets are going to be rising up, seducing people away from the truth. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will wax cold or grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Kind of sounds like what he says, the same exact thing to the churches, doesn't he? He who overcomes, <laughs> I will give this and this. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world, until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. For if anyone says to you, look, here is an anointed one, or there, do not believe it. For false anointed ones and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to seduce, deceive, lead astray, if possible, even the very elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, listen, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because I'm fearful that someone may come in with another Jesus, another gospel, or another spirit, and you may very well accept him. He says, no, this is no marvel, later on in the chapter, verse, chapter 11, he says, this is no marvel for Satan himself transforms himself to be an angel of light. If I said to you, talk to you about an angel of light, without you knowing the context, full context of that chapter, you would think that the angel of light was, a, was an angel was an angel of God. But Satan himself portrays himself to be an angel of light, an angel of truth. And it says, therefore, it's no marvel if his ministers also transform themselves to be ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. There are assemblies in this city, undoubtedly in my mind, who are being led by ministers of Satan. I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. We're going to look at some indicators in a moment, but the reality is, that there are those that are out there. The Word of God tells me that's going to happen. And Jesus says that as we get closer and closer to the end times, that there will be false anointed ones. And I think it's really interesting over the last 10 to 15 years how the term anointings has really caught on. Before the last 15 to 20 years, we really didn't hear that word a whole lot. But now all of a sudden there's an anointing. There's an anointing down in Pensacola. There's an anointing up in Toronto. There's pastors around the church who have, or on, on, on radio who have what? Anointings. I remember years ago preaching a funeral and a guy came up and said, man, you really are anointed. And I went, ah! Like, no, no. But uh, there's, there's a positive side of that because we do have an anointing from the Holy One, right? But we've got to be careful because that word, Christ, is the word, Mashiach, in the Hebrew, and it means anointed one. Be careful. It doesn't mean Christ. That means that when somebody comes, they're not going to be calling themselves Jesus Christ. They're just going to say that they have what? An anointing from the Holy One. They're, they're anointed ones. And we're told in the end times there are going to be many anointed ones. We miss it in the English. We're looking for all these people saying they're the Christ. Now there are some who do come up and try to portray themselves as Messiahs. But the reality is there are going to be a lot of false teachers that are going to come into our world. We, we're told this as well in um, Timothy Second, Paul's second letter to Timothy in chapter 3, where he says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving, that's our word, seducing, leading astray, and what? Being deceived. They're, I mean, they're going to be so in, involved in this thing that they're going to be deceiving each other. They're going to be deceiving you, they're going to be deceiving each other, they're going to be supporting one another, it's going to be a, a total mess. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. Do you know why it's important for you to be spending the time right now to read the Word of God? Because Satan wants you to fall. And he's going to mix a little bit of truth with a little bit of error. And if you don't know what the truth is, you won't know the error. Do you know that our government doesn't give the, the guys who are, are trained to, to find counterfeit money, they don't give them counterfeit money to study? Do you know what they study? The real thing. They spend hours upon hours studying the, 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 the details of the real thing. So when they see something that's done really well, 
they're able to find out what a fake is. And we talked a few weeks ago about that word, uh, dokamas. And a dokamas, remember dokamas, is, the, is the being tested and found to be genuine, found to be true. In the end, you are going to be tested. God already knows. He knows whether you're just a cubic zirconian, a cubic zirconian, or whether you're a real diamond. He knows whether you're the real thing or just an imposter. But in the end, there are going to be evil men, there are going to be imposters, people pretending to be ministers of righteousness. Check me out. Every time I teach, check me out. Just to make sure that I'm not one of these guys. Now, I know I'm not. But ultimately, you're going to be responsible to God to find out whether I am. And some of you are transient. And so you're going to leave from this church and you're going to go to other places. Check them out. I remember when I first got saved. The statement that I made from the pulpit. Anyways, behind the pulpit because we were giving our testimony when we joined the church. Back at the time, I just got baptized, and we were joining the church, and I told everybody, and I understand that Pastor Woody was the one who led me to the Lord. I said, I'll never believe anything Woody ever preaches from the pulpit. Because I was lied to for 23 years. And the Bible says that I'm supposed to be like a Berean, and I'm supposed to search the scriptures daily to find out the things that are being taught is true. Now, I can't say that I checked out everything he ever taught. But I can tell you honestly that my desire is I don't use commentaries to prepare for messages until afterwards. Because I know how easily influenced I can be. And you read books, and you're going to be impressed by what you read. If I ask people right now on the street to explain to me the end time events, many people are going to quote to me the Left Behind series. I praise God for Tim LaHaye. And uh, Jenkins, I can't remember his first name. Jerry. Jerry Jenkins. And for putting those... Terry? Jerry. 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 Putting those, those books together. But as we're going to find out as we get into it, they're wrong. I mean, I, mean the, I, I am baptistic in my doctrine, and I am a dispensationalist through and through. But I am also a biblicist. And I choose not to just grab a hold of, of doctrine that has been handed down... Um, to generation to generation to generation, I want to check it out. And the way it's presented isn't biblical. And I'm going to challenge you with that going into it. That's why we're going to go back to the Old Testament, and we're going to work it coming all the way up through. We're going to build the foundation that should be laid. And we're told that the Old Testament, the writings of the prophets, are the foundation upon which the New Testament is given to us. And we need to understand the Old Covenant before we can understand the New Covenant. We need to understand how God has worked through the ages, because He is the same yesterday as He is today, and He will be what? Forever. He doesn't change. His plan has not changed. It's been consistently the same. And we'll see that as we go further on into the prophetic portion of the book of Revelation. But anyways, so he goes on. He says, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. But note, you're going to know the rest of this passage. This is amazing. From whom you've learned them. And from childhood you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now this is the verse that you've memorized. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does he want to equip us for? Keep it in context. To be ready for the evil men and the imposters. Be ready for those who are wicked, the wicked men. And they're coming and they're seeking to seduce you away from the truth. God has given you a manual to study to know, to learn. So that you will not be seduced. And as Jesus said in Matthew 24, he says it's going to be so impressive that it was, if it was possible, if it was possible, even the very elect would be deceived. That means if you're not true, if you're not real, guess what's going to happen? You will be deceived. It's not a matter of maybe, but you will be. The next passage we want to look at is 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 6, and then down to 17 and 18. It says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. In other words, they're going to come and they're going to mock what? The testimony of God's word. 
They're going to challenge the testimony of God's word. Does it sound like anybody in the scriptures, like maybe chapter 3 of Genesis, first couple of verses? Serpent. The serpent who came to Eve and said, did God really say? And he questioned the integrity of God's word. Guess what? They're going to do the same thing. They're going to come in and they're going to say, looky, you guys keep saying this, but you know what? Where's the evidence? It's not happened. It's not going to happen. It's a storybook. It's a fable. It's a bunch of myths. I remember my grandma, for years, said to me, Robert, you are not mean to tell me that you really believe those things, do you? Yes, Grandma, I really do. And praise God, two weeks before she died, she got saved. And I got to see her the day before she died. She says, it took me so long enough to know my Jesus. Could you imagine the regret, though, that she had for 80-something years to believe the National Geographic over the Word of God? And that's, that's, that's a fact. I mean, that's where she got her theology. She was a student of the National Geographic. We put them in our homes and have our kids read them. It's no wonder sometimes they're confused. It's amazing. I'm going through the Ken Ham videos now with, on Wednesday night. And some of these kids that I pick up on the, in, on the bus, and I, uh, the bus, my van, it's not a bus, it's my van. Anyways, I pick them up in my van and I bring them to church. They're confused. Why? Because at school, what are they being taught? Evolution. Evolution. But God's word says what? Creation. Six days, not millions of years. But we've been influenced. If you've got a Schofield reference Bible, it's going to try to tell you how you can put those billions of years in there. That's because he was influenced by the imposters of the world. We don't have to have billions of years. Do you believe God or do you believe the, the scientists who are, who are atheists, no God believers? Why am I going to take some of the things that Richard Dawkins says and try to bring them into the Bible? The guy is anti-God. He's anti-Christ. I'd rather take what God says and hold to that. So we go on. He says, now... You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, you know that they're going to be coming, you know they're going to be doing this, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being seduced, led away, deceived, with the air of the wicked. But grow. <laughs> Isn't it awesome how there's always this contrast? Don't do this, but do this. Don't be led astray, but rather do what? But grow in the grace, in the intimate knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. How much time, how much endeavor are you seeking to prepare yourself for the wiles of the devil? Are you taking up the whole armor of God? Are you putting on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness? Are you having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? Are you putting on the helmet of salvation, taking the sword of the Spirit and the, and the shield of faith? And above all, praying with all prayers for all the saints? with all prayer and supplication. We need to be prepared, seeking to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have 1 John 4, 1-6, finally here. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. Listen, straight off the bat, if someone doesn't declare that Jesus is God in the flesh, they're not true. They're false prophets. Be careful of what you read. I was talking to somebody recently about a book that they got. And there's a lot of truth in it. There's a lot of good stuff. But you've got to be careful because it's written by a false prophet. There's a lot of good health and wealth and, and spiritual, you know, nutritional stuff that's out there. You've got to be careful about who's writing it. If it's coming from a New Age perspective, then it has New Age tentacles attached to it. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that Eastern mysticism doesn't have some kernels of truth. All truth comes from who? From God. And Satan likes to take truth and do what with it? Twist it and mix it with air. But we've got to be careful when we're in the world, not to grab a hold of people that, that are ungodly, who are not declaring that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and start to read their stuff. There's a, too much good stuff to be inundated with, rather than the word being inundated with false stuff. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming, and now already is in the world. Look, it's all, 2,000 years it's been here. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world. And the world what? The world hears them. 
So what does it say if we hear them? Let's go on. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now there may be those who come in the name of Jesus. First, Second Corinthians chapter 11, remember I said that? Come in the name of Jesus, another gospel, another spirit. But you've got to be careful that the Jesus that they're proclaiming is the Jesus that you serve. They may come in the name of the gospel. But you've got to be careful. The gospel is the true gospel. And that is, is by God's grace through faith alone. And then you've got to be careful of the spirit. They have the spirit. The spirit's all over them. They have anointing of the spirit. My question is, what spirit? Well, there are two indicators right here that I'm told. First of all, if they don't declare that Jesus is God, they're antichrist. They're false spirits. If they will not listen to the testimony of the word of God, that's what Paul, or John says at the end. He who knows, knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. So, this is what we're talking about, right? If they will not listen to the counsel of the word of God, they are antichrist. They are not of God. Now, that may step on some of your toes. So many times we like to do what? Choose, pick and choose what parts of the Word of God we want to listen to. I hope that's not true of any one of you. But if it is, question yourself. Paul says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. All the way from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, was the, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, all the way down to Revelation chapter 22 talking about the tree of life and that how the Spirit says come. It's all God's Word. And it's all 100% true. That's the only way that we're going to be protected from the, the spirit of deception. He goes on, and this is Ephesians chapter 4. He says he gave himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of teaching, or doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of seductive methods. The word plotting there is the word methodia, which is where we get our word method. Seductive plotting. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should not no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past failing have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness. What is he saying? Listen. Because there's these men that are going to be out there, you've got to be careful, and we need to be seeking to build one another up into the Christ and moving away from the lust that we used to walk in. If you're still walking in the lust that you used to have before you were saved, you're a prime target. You'll never know when the seduction comes. Why? Because you've already given yourself over to the seduction spirit. And then he goes on, he says, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man, put off the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How? By putting on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So, to the church, we, we see that there is this challenge given because they were giving themselves over to the seductress. But we see as well that there is a challenge to the seductress, and we want to go through this quickly. First of all, Christ says he called for her to repent. He called. He called for her to repent. But not only did he call for her to repent, he gave her time to repent. I need to recall this as, as a dad sometimes. I mean, I really struggle with this part of it. I want instant what? Repentance. I, I want them to change, my, my, my kids to change the way they think just in the twinkling of an eye. And I have to remind myself that I don't do that sometimes. And so I have to be willing to give them space, time, to be able to think about it, process it, and to change. I remember sitting around Pastor Woody's table with Barry Quartz, and we get the Quartz newsletter sometimes, they're missionaries down in Argentina, fighting because I was blue in the face for, for evolution. I believe in evolution. My mom taught me years ago, she doesn't believe this now, but she taught me years ago theistic evolution, because I was being taught evolution in, in the schools, and so she was afraid, you know, I guess, I don't know, I, you know, think back of all this, and so she taught me how, how evolution in the Bible can go hand in hand. And so, 
theistic evolution. That's what I believe. And so here I am sitting there, I'm being discipled, and they start talking about creation. Well, I know that's not true. I mean, I know it couldn't have happened in six 24 hours. Nothing can happen that fast. I mean, especially when you look out there. I mean, good grief. And, and all the scientists throughout the world have told me what? That I was born from an ape, you know? And so, um, anyways, fun stuff. Blue in the face, I fought. But you know what I realized in the middle of the argument? I was wrong. But do you think in my pride I was going to admit that? No way, dude. I fought and fought and fought. Finally, I left mad. Do you know why I was mad? Because I was wrong. <laughs> and I knew I was wrong. But I needed space. I needed time to repent, to change the way I thought. And I praise God that Woody gave it to me. You know? He probably was struggling too. He probably was like I was on the other side thinking, why can't you get this? Without realizing that I did get it. I just didn't want to admit it. Anyways. But Christ does that for even those of the Jezebe Jezebelian spirit. Think about that. What a God of grace we have. I mean, there is nobody more wicked on the face of the earth than Jezebel. And to call her that, to call these people by that name, shows how wicked they were in the eyes of God. And God says, even to them, I'm giving them a space. I'm giving them time to repent. But they would what? They would not. They rejected they rejected the repentance. They rejected the, the, the desire, the, the, the forgiveness that God was offering them. Why? Because it came from a heart of rejection. And finally, there was going to be then the assurance of retribution. Not just retribution to Jezebel herself, but also to her children. God, Christ says, I'm going to take Jezebel and I'm going to throw her into a, to a bed of tribulation. There's going to be tribulation that comes upon her troublesome times like she has never experienced before. And all of those who have, have, are her children, who follow after her teachings, they're going to experience death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Why do we think it's any other thing? Listen, when we turn away from God and we walk a, a contrary to the ways of God, it's going to bring destruction. It's going to bring death. So Christ promised. What an awesome promise. To those who overcome, I will give power over the nations. We don't have time for this. We'll be talking about this later on when we get to the, toward the end of the book of Revelation. And that is that we as believers, when we overcome, we will reign with Christ. It's an awesome, awesome privilege. I, I, I can't even fathom it. But this is more incredible. I will give them the morning star. Do you remember last week? When we talked about the church of Pergamos, he says, to those who overcome, I will give them to eat of the hidden manna. Remember how we went back and we looked at the hidden manna, it was, how it was hidden. But then we said, we looked at John chapter 6, who was the manna? Christ. Christ. And so the idea is that we can eat and partake of Christ. Do you know who the morning star is? Jesus Christ. Later in the book of Revelation, I think it's chapter 22, chapter 21 and 22, we're told that Jesus Christ himself is the morning star. There are, there are commentators, it's just mind-boggling to me, who, who re just ignore that passage. I mean, the Bible defines who the morning star is. It's Jesus Christ. He is the morning star. And Jesus says, when you overcome, I will give you to be a partaker with me. You will be one with me. I will give you myself. When the trials and tribulations come, when Satan comes with his seduction, and you overcome, at that moment, you get even more Jesus. Now I understand you got all of Jesus when you got saved. You got all the grace. But there is some manner in which that when you overcome those trials, you're able to grow in grace. And you're able to grow in faith. And you're able to get to know Jesus in a better way than you ever knew him before. We don't want to go through those trials. We don't want to go through those seductions. But you know what? We're living in a proving ground. What are we proving with our life? How would the Lord describe your life? If he was to describe it right now, what testimony would you have? Have you become a victim to the Jezebelian effects of our culture? And finally, believers, your faithfulness and diligence will be worthwhile in the end. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. Lord, forgive me for, for waxing long. But God, it is your word, and it is important 
It is powerful. It is quick. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It proceeds from your mouth. It is that which is truth and how we need it in a land in which we are given many quote-unquote truths. But Lord, we know that they're not truth. And anything that is not absolute truth is a lie, is false, is wickedness, is evil, is deception. God, I pray that you would protect us from the evil one. Protect us, Lord. Guide us. Instruct us. Help us, Lord, to desire to glorify you in all that we do. Help us to live in such a way that our lives shine brilliantly on your behalf. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.